Welcome to our third pandemic podcast. Warm welcome to everyone listening in, whether or not you're a regular part of the CBC Church family. There is a sermon outline with some discussion questions available, and if you'd like that, look up Carnoustie Baptist Church online or on Facebook and you'll find contact details. I'm recording this on Friday the 3rd of April, so next week is Easter week. I think many of us will be feeling our separation as a church family all more acutely through this week. But being apart does not change the realities of what Jesus has done. The significance of what we celebrate at Easter, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in our separation we can ask God to deepen our understanding of it all. To deepen our longing for that day when, because of our crucified and risen Saviour, we will in our resurrection bodies be together with God's people from every age in his presence eternally. During this coming week we will have some extra opportunities to virtually gather together. Uh, Monday to Friday 9.30am on the app or programme Zoom uh, there will be a short reflection on Romans 5. And we'll be back on Zoom on Sunday morning at our usual service time, 11 o'clock, with some time in Romans 6. This will be something that the whole family can engage with on Sunday morning. Uh, Church family will send out the details for accessing this. Anyone else who's interested in joining, uh, please get in touch and we can get the details to you. For those who can't access these online, they will also be made available as a podcast. Well, before we look at God's word together, we're going to take some time to pray. Last week we were praying for the most vulnerable in our own society. It is so easy to become self-absorbed at a time like this. Uh, Even in the news we consume to focus on our own immediate circumstances, to become so concerned with the day-to-day changes that we're experiencing that we forget those around us who are most vulnerable. But it's even easier to forget the rest of the world. One of our mission partners based in Afghanistan wrote this week about the challenge of returning to the UK while Afghanistan faces a health crisis the likes of which we simply cannot imagine given the infrastructure differences between our countries. He said it is particularly at times like this that our Western privilege can feel really uncomfortable. Most of us, though, we're so immersed every day in that privilege, we never really feel the discomfort. We face a hugely challenging situation in this country, we can't deny that. But we have little idea what people around the world are facing, such as the 100 million internal migrant labourers in India who've lost their work and many trying to return on foot to native villages and families. So let's pray for such people around the world. With a particular focus on those countries our mission partners work in and also on the persecuted church. Let's take some time now to pray. Almighty God, you are the one who made the world and everything in it. You are Lord of heaven and earth and you yourself give to all humanity life and breath and everything. Father, your desire is that we should seek you And you promised that we would find you when we seek with all our heart. And though our sin came between us, a gulf that we could never cross, we thank you that you sent Jesus to cross that gulf for us, to pay the penalty we deserve, taking our sin upon himself and giving us his righteousness. Lord, we confess that in our selfishness we so often focus only on ourselves or those closest to us. We forget that you are the God of all the earth, the one who gives life to all humanity, the one who is calling to himself a people from every tribe, language and nation. And so now we come to pray for our world at a time when almost every nation has been impacted in some way by the current pandemic. We think particularly of the poorest people in the poorest countries who do not have the health infrastructure we do, nor the means of communication to keep informed or to maintain contact with loved ones. We're aware that in our own society, the impact of this virus is far more than medical, and how much more so for the poor around the world. Lord, we pray for those countries where our mission partners are working. 
We think of Comfort International's partners in Rwanda, Burundi, Congo and South Sudan, where infection rates are still low but many people are struggling to access food as lockdown leaves them in economic crisis. We thank you that Comfort have been able to send out emergency funds and food and we pray this would get to those in most need without hindrance. We pray for Romania and particularly for the railway children families who have little or no safety net in terms of money and food and no means of contact during lockdown. We pray that you would provide for them and that Vision Romania's partners would be able to make contact and give help where needed. We pray that the gospel that has been proclaimed and displayed to these families would bring hope and comfort. We pray also for our BMS World Mission partners. Protect our partner in Tunisia and as they are able to do some work from home we pray that the Women's Project would not suffer from the lockdown. We thank you that both families based in Afghanistan managed to be reunited in the UK we ask that you would give them peace as they feel the distance from their local workers, neighbours and those that they've been working with. We pray for that country, one of the poorest in the world with very limited infrastructure and we ask that you would give the resources they need and protect the health system from being completely overwhelmed. We ask also for the few secret Christians in Afghanistan that at this time you would enable them somehow to convey the hope they have in Christ Jesus. We pray the same for persecuted Christians around the world. Lord, we ask that in this crisis they would not be used as scapegoats by those who hate them, but that in the midst of trouble you would strengthen them and build your church even in the most dangerous countries. May this time of Easter be a time of great encouragement and growth for them. And may we too continue to grow in faith knowledge and love at this time and continue to keep those in most need in our prayers offering practical help where we can and as we come to your word now lord we ask that you would speak to us let us be those who listen and with the help of your spirit do as your word says amen well let's turn now to god's word and we're reading from luke 6 and this reading covers the calling of the Twelve Apostles and the first part of what's known as the Sermon on the Plain. It's probably not just a, a shorter version of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, but a separate sermon covering some of the same material. These sections may on first reading seem quite disparate, but as we've been seeing throughout Luke, they fit the wider narrative. The calling of the Apostles sets the scene for Jesus teaching on what it is to be a disciple, to follow him. So please read with me. Luke chapter 6, I'm reading from the ESV and reading from verse 12. Luke 6, verse 12. In these days, <clears throat> Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And he came down with them, and stood on a level place, with a great crowd of his disciples, and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich! 
for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Amen. Well, the first thing to remember as we look at these verses is that verse 12 has a background. Through the end of chapter 5 and into chapter 6, Luke has been detailing growing opposition to Jesus from the religious leaders. And in these days, verse 12 says, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray and all night he continued in prayer. His prayer was about the big decision he faced regarding the apostles, but it was also in the context of threat. We've touched on this before. Jesus was fully human. He didn't stop being God, but he willingly submitted the exercise of his divinity to the Father. In other words, as he himself said in John's Gospel, I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And there follows a very simple question for us. If Jesus, who is God, is eternal, through whom and for whom all things were created, who was full of the Spirit and preached and healed and called with authority, if he had to live his human life, in dependence on God, expressed in prayer, well, how much more should we? As in verse 12, I think this will be most evident to us at times of pressure. It is vital at any time, but one of our responses to the current pandemic, as we're brought to realise afresh our need for God, it should be to intensify our prayer. Well, having spent the night in prayer, in verse 13, Jesus gathers his disciples and he chooses 12 of them to be apostles. Apostle is a title, it means sent. But surely all of Jesus' disciples are sent. Our statement of identity here at CB, CBC says that we are called to be disciples and sent to make disciples of Jesus Christ. So if we're all sent, are we all apostles? Well, not exactly. Because it's a designation of office. Only 14 people in the New Testament are named apostles. There's these 12. There's Matthias who replaced Judas. And there's Paul. There are others who claimed to be apostles but they're called false apostles. And the fact that Jesus chose 12 helps explain what's going on here. The Jews would instantly connect the number with the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jesus is pointing to the fact that the true Israel, the fulfilment of all God's promises in the Old Testament, it was to be made up of his disciples, his followers, those who walk closely with and serve him. So the apostles are almost a picture. They are in themselves a parable. Some of them are, of course, very important in the life of the early church. James was the first martyr after Stephen. John wrote a gospel, he wrote three letters, he wrote Revelation. Peter was the early leader and the first to take the gospel to the Gentiles. But we know next to nothing about the others. And there's almost nothing, also nothing remarkable about them as people. None of them were particularly rich or well educated or well connected. They were commoners, they were country boys, including a few fishermen. All of them except Judas were from Galilee, which was a despised backwater. Among their number were a former zealot, a freedom fighter, terrorist, against the Romans, and a former tax collector, a collaborator with the Romans. They were hardly your ideal candidates to have working together on a team. And of course, Judas is included in the list. He who became a traitor. See, there's been no attempt to airbrush history. To make the twelve seem like a perfect group. To be those who are best qualified to be the core of this new Israel. Far from it. There's nothing that sets these men apart from all the other disciples. Not their abilities, nor their willingness. They're not of a higher status than the others. It is a particular role that is given by the choice of God 
and revealed to Jesus as he prayed. After he calls them, Jesus leads them down the mountain. And we can picture the people gathering round him, the twelve closest to him. That's their first appearance as this chosen inner circle. Then the rest of his disciples, and then the great multitude who had come from all over as Jesus' fame spread. Judea, Jerusalem, even Tyre and Sidon, which were Gentile areas. And I wonder how much the crowd recognised the significance of that inner circle. As I said, the number 12 would instantly recall the 12 tribes. They are this visual indication of what Jesus has been doing since the beginning of his ministry, showing that the whole of the Old Testament is fulfilled in him. He is the hope of Israel. He's the one who shows what it truly means to be a part of the people of God. The one who can bring God's people into the promised land, into the fullness of all God's promises of blessing. The religious leaders were already displaying their lack of love for God and their neighbour. And as Jesus would make clear in later parables, the kingdom of God was being taken from them and given to a new people represented by these apostles. This is truly remarkable and it should be a great encouragement to us. In a very visual way, he demonstrates what it is to belong to the kingdom of God. If that belonging was on the basis of human standards, there'd not be a lot of hope for us. Only those who were exceptional in intelligence or fame, social standing, social connections, wealth or goodness, only they would have any hope. But these count for nothing in the kingdom of God. And the first part of Jesus' sermon will show that powerfully. It doesn't mean that those who have these things are automatically excluded from the kingdom, but they cannot rely on them. It's a wonderful quote from Oswald Chambers, which is in the newsletter. He said, God can achieve his purpose either through the absence of human resources or the abandonment of reliance on them. All through history, God has chosen and used nobodies because their unusual dependence on him made possible the unique display of his power and grace. He chose and used somebodies only when they renounced dependence on their natural abilities and resources. The twelve were, in those words, nobodies. Anything they had, they left behind for Jesus. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, writes about his own experience in Philippians 3. Unlike these men, he had a lot to boast, both ethnically and religiously. But he says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He didn't suddenly lose his intellectual abilities. His letters show that remarkable intellect at work. He carried on in his trade, his skill, tent making, when he needed to. But he no longer relied on these things, nor on his ethnic background, nor on his religious observance. He used them in the service of God. Whoever we are, whatever resources we have, however much or little, we can be a part of the kingdom of God. We can enjoy the privilege of being counted as his and the responsibility of declaring the gospel to the world. 1 Corinthians 1 and 1 Peter 2 speak so powerfully of this. It is entirely God's choice, his call, his power that qualifies us. Nothing in ourselves. As another writer, writer put it, our, order, sorry, our ordinariness makes room for his extraordinariness. And this principle... I think is made very clear as Jesus begins to preach and so often everything seems upside down in what he says. Verse 20 tells us that Jesus lifted up his eyes on his disciples and spoke. The crowd no doubt heard the sermon but its message is primarily for those who are already disciples. It's for us. Jesus has turned things upside down in his choice of the nobodies to represent God's work in creating a new people. He continues to do so in his teaching as he expresses what life as a disciple is like, particularly in a hostile world. 
This is God's extraordinary calling to us. Ordinary people made disciples. The first part of the sermon is similar to the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, but there's some important differences. It's much more direct. So rather than Jesus saying, blessed are they, he says, blessed are you. There are no positives in these four blessings, such as blessed are the pure in heart. There's only what most people would consider negatives, such as poverty. These in Luke are much more stark. Rather than addressing the poor in spirit, Jesus simply says the poor. And unlike the Beatitudes, they also have counterparts. Woe to you who are rich and so on. That word woe is perhaps more familiar from the woes pronounced on the Pharisees and scribes in Matthew 23 and Luke 11. They're like curses, the counterpart from Deuteronomy to the blessings that were promised to those who heard and obeyed God's word. We read them as outbursts of anger, as expressions of judgment, and to an extent that's what they are. The word expresses deep misery with no consolation or hope. It expresses the eternal fate of those who reject Jesus. But it's not something that's proclaimed with joy. There's no delight here in the downfall of the wicked. Because it also implies sorrow on the part of the one pronouncing this woe. Sorrow that comes because of compassion. So Jesus, he delights to speak of the blessing of his people. But seeing the fate of those who reject him causes deep anguish. We're going to look at the four themes Jesus covers. Looking at the blessing and the curse together. First of all, Jesus looks at his disciples and says to them, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. He says that they are poor. It's a simple statement, statement of fact, and anyone who knows what they've left behind to follow Jesus will see their poverty. In Luke 9 verse 58 Speaking to some prospective disciples, Jesus said, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Those who were to follow Jesus, they gave up much. In very practical, physical, material terms, they gave up much. But Jesus promises that those who have given up much to follow Jesus will receive much. They will inherit the kingdom. In chapter 18, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. By contrast, Jesus says, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. In judgment, God gives us what we want. If we want riches in this life, that will be what we put our trust in, and all we will get is the things of this world. We may get lots, we may get very little, but if our trust and desires are rooted in this earth, we will find in the end it is all we have. Jesus isn't suggesting a sort of simple rule that poverty makes people happy and riches make people miserable. Poverty in scripture is recognised as the evil it is at times. God's people are called to work to alleviate it. But scripture also recognises that poverty can lead to blessing. If it leads to dependence on God and opens us to receive the joy of his salvation. Also, those who are rich won't necessarily end their lives in misery. Psalm 73 talks about that. It's people who have no regard for God, yet seem entirely happy in their wealth. But Psalm 73 also talks about eternity. Those who are determined to find satisfaction in material possessions will get no more. Death will bring them no peace, only separation from God. Those who look to God, who make Jesus their refuge, they may struggle in this life, but they will find that eternity brings unimaginable joy and satisfaction. Whom have I in heaven but you? 
and there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Jesus puts it this way in Luke 12, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where's your heart? Where's mine? Do I trust Jesus enough and desire him enough to accept poverty for the sake of the kingdom? As he embraced poverty to come for our salvation? Well, Jesus goes on to say to his disciples, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Hunger, it's an expression of need. It's linked to poverty. Those who are poor feel hunger because they don't have enough food. Those who hunger for God have recognised their poverty, their need for him in all things, and God promises them satisfaction. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. By contrast, Jesus says, Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Those who believe they have all they want, who believe they lack nothing, they're blind. They cannot see their need. They may have times when they sense the emptiness of all they have. They may hunger for more of the same. One day they will know true hunger when they see what they have rejected for the sake of satisfaction on earth. Now, of course, those who follow Jesus do experience hunger and thirst, both physically and spiritually. And indeed, if we're not hungering for God, I'd suggest there's something wrong in our lives spiritually. Think of Psalm 42. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Or Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. That psalm goes on, My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And Psalm 34 says that those who fear him have no lack, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Of course we don't see this fully. Not yet. In a broken world, when we daily battle sin in our own lives and, and see the, the struggle of life in a broken world, we do still experience satisfaction from God, but hunger is a given. Psalm 34 also says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. When we have tasted the goodness of God, our hunger will only grow for more of him. But the promise still stands. You shall be satisfied. Jesus then says, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. This is something that we don't often think about. Jesus' disciples are told that they will be weepers. We're not called to be joyless like the Pharisees, though sometimes that's exactly what our faith has come. I was amused reading a quote from Robert Louis Stevenson. He once wrote, in great surprise, I have been to church today and I am not depressed. Well, we're told in many times in the New Testament to rejoice. Our, our faith should be marked by joy. In Jesus, there is so much to rejoice in and we should stand out even in difficult circumstances, because of that joy that fills us. But we should also know when to weep. And this is the difference with you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Those who are full of superficial merriment, who are unable to recognise when it is appropriate to laugh, or unable to recognise what should cause us to weep, they will weep at their own end. So if disciples are to be those who weep, when should we weep and why? Well, we weep over poverty, injustice, abuse, betrayal, rejection, adultery, loneliness, bereavement, illness, sin. 
and we weep over those who are lost without Jesus. But while we weep, we look forward with joy to the day these things will come to an end, to the day when there will be no more weeping. And as we wait for that day, Jesus identifies one more mark of disciples. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Again, this is not just a general blessing for everyone who is disliked, not even for every Christian who is disliked. Because if that dislike is the result of an obnoxious, aggressive, uncaring attitude, then frankly it is deserved. But Jesus says, blessed are you when people hate you on account of the Son of Man. I guess we could think of that phrase, on account of the Son of Man, as being hated for being like Jesus, living like him, loving like him, speaking of him. That brings conflict. Because it's a love that calls people to change. It's not a blind acceptance of them. It brings conflict also because we have a spiritual enemy who does not want Jesus to be honoured and followed. And the New Testament is very clear that persecution is part of discipleship. Jesus goes on, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. The prophets were widely hated because their messages were uncomfortable. They called for people to change in response to the love of God, but also with awareness of his just and certain judgment. And the comparison Jesus makes in verse 26 is striking. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. False prophets in the Old Testament and ever since, they told people what they wanted to hear. And so they were popular. Their supposed messages from God, they simply affirmed people in their godless lives. So again, we're challenged to think about what we really want. Do we want popularity on earth? Well, if so, we will inevitably compromise. Sadly, we've seen that with churches keen to keep their status, their position in our society. They will not hold to the unpopular truths of God's word. But if we're motivated by the eternal reward that Jesus promises, we will receive true joy here and now. And we'll have the desire to seek God's grace to live the Christ-like life, displaying his goodness and declaring the gospel no matter the cost. Well, as we come to a finish, we see how this extraordinary call to ordinary people fits in with so much of what Luke has said already. Jesus is turning everything on its head. The world's shallow values are being rejected in favour of the eternal values of God's kingdom. And we see it beautifully in the Magnificat in Mary's song in chapter 1. She sings, He has shown strength with his arm." He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. We only see this in part now. But one day we will see fully how God's kingdom brings full satisfaction and joy for his people. And we long for that day of his return. We cry out, come Lord Jesus. But until then, we ordinary disciples who are so often aware of our inadequacy, we need to seek God and to trust him for the grace to follow his extraordinary calling. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you have chosen the weak and foolish of this world to shame the wise and strong. Lord, we know how ordinary we are. We know how sinful we are. And yet we also know 
that in your grace you have set your love upon us. You have called us. You have given us your grace to live an extraordinary life. One that stands out from the world and as such points people to Christ. We know that many respond negatively but our desire Lord is that others would see our lives and hear our words be pointed to Christ and come to him in faith. Lord it is only you in your extraordinary grace and power who can achieve this. And we ask that you would. And now may the Lord make our love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. May he strengthen our hearts so that we will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.